command. And we're telling it, I want to read the output. So when this is done, I simply scan F the number of processes and the username. I close FP and then I print out. So I'll let you execute this and see how it works. But this is pretty much all there is about Poppin. In the seminar, you will actually play with implementing one uh, using fork exec and dup and dup2, which we're just gonna jump into. So let me see if there are any questions about this, and then I'll move to dup and dup2, which are a little weird, and I will need your attention. Can we use pop and yeah, absolutely. You can just put the the script name right here, obviously with its path or relative path, and it will do it. Yeah. All right. Other other things about Poppin? Yeah, it's what's inside Poppin is a fork exec. Uh, Berzent, when you say C++ scripts, what do you mean? What's a C++? Are you, are you thinking of compiled programs of your own? If that's what you're wondering, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But you have to compile them. You can run anything. You can even compile it if you want. You can run GCC to compile it and then run the program. <clears throat> so now I will need you to be to pay attention to this because it's a little unexpected. And uh, I'll just have to go through it a little a little on the long side. So what I want to do now is show you what is happening behind the scenes when you run something like this in the command line. What is Bash doing that makes this program run? And how the heck does it take its output and plug it as input here? And then how does it take this guy's output and plug it as input here? What's behind the scenes? This is what we're going to look into. But uh, before we do that, we have to understand uh, the notion of process file descriptor table. So let me scroll up a little more. Okay, so this is it. Every single program has an array with the files that it opened. All right? And that array contains on each position a handler that knows how to deal with the device behind the file descriptor. So for instance, on position zero, there will be some kind of, you can think of it as a handle or a pointer to a function, something that knows how to read from the console, which is different than reading from a file, right? A console, there are key presses you can delete from the console, right? You hit enter. Reading from the console is not the same thing as reading from a file. So there is on position zero, some kind of handle that knows how to deal with reading the console. On position one, there is a handle that knows how to deal with writing to the console. Again, it's going to be different than writing to a file because it has to display these things on the screen. Then on position two, there will be a handle for handling writing to the console as a standard error. And so on. Every time you open a file, it will get a number, an ID which is actually the position in this table. So if we are to look at this little piece of code, which is not really clean because it doesn't close whatever it opens. But the point is, you open a file a.txt. This will be just placed on the next available position, on 3. And on position 3, which incident incidentally will be the value of, F of fd after you call open, you'll have a handle that knows how to write in file a.txt. Next, you open, let's suppose this is a FIFO, right? You'll have on position, my FIFO will be 4, and you'll have there a handle that knows how to deal with a FIFO. And then you create two pipes. 
Now each pipe will come back with two file descriptors. So position five, six, you'll have PA, PA of zero will be five, PA of one will be six, and they will have here handles that know how to read and write into a pipe, which is totally different from a file. And then the same thing for PB. All right, are we good with this, this array? Every time you open a file, it gets a new position, and there will be a handle that needs to that, that knows how to deal with the device behind. So this is the point where DAP and DAP2 become useful. These two functions can be used to manipulate this array. All right, so let's have a look at this. Uh, If you call somewhere in this program after you're done, just here, right before the return. Um, no, it doesn't. So void boy wannabe. If you close a file, it's not gonna, I, I don't think it's gonna free the position in the array. It's just gonna leave it there and, and move on. So if sometimes right here, right in this place, before the return, you add this instruction, dup my FIFO. What this does is actually copies this, because this belongs to my FIFO. It copies this on a new position, entry nine. So it basically duplicates the handle that knows how to deal with FIFO, that is connected to FIFO, it duplicates it. So FIFO is open for reading, so whether I read from 4 or from 9, it will be the same thing. I simply have another entry point. Okay, that's all there is. DAP2 is a little different. DAP2 overwrites. So if I call this, right, somewhere before the return, what this will do is it will take the handle of PA0, the one that knows how to deal with the pipe, right? So it takes this and it overwrites the stuff on the first position. So the first position will look like this. So after this point, and this is this is what, what you need to get, after calling this, any scanf, any get s, any c in will go to zero as usual, but it will not come from the console, it will come from the pipe because it will use this handle to get data. Now, water addict, you're saying F reopen, what the heck is F? Mm, let me see, never use that. Mm -hmm. You see, the original stream is closed. It's not the same thing. DAP doesn't quite close. DAP will close whatever is overwriting. So DAP will close this. DAP2 will close this before overwriting it. But this one will not close. You'll just have the same thing in two places. Maybe, maybe... Yeah, yeah, Rarish, this is what we'll do. This is what we'll do. I'll get to it. But it's not a F reopen because we're not reopening anything. We're just copying the same thing. We're working behind the scenes here, guys. We are working into the guts of the process. It's not like we are opening again the file. Opening again, so, so let me clarify this. If you reopen a file, you're gonna probably be repositioned at the beginning, right? You're not gonna keep the old position in the file. But this doesn't do that. This simply copies the thing with everything. So it continues, it, it, it's just a copy. 
you don't reopen, you just have two things that point to the same. So mortuary, and that's why you can also pipe and put in files. I'm not quite following mortuary. I'm kind of getting confused to what you're saying, but yeah, with, with this you can, yeah, you can write and let me see how it's done because I'm not quite following what you're saying. <laughs> it's all right. So just keep this in mind. That's it. It doesn't reopen anything. It only copies this. So, so when I say here a handle, this handle will contain information about where the position is in the file and how the file was open for reading, for writing and whatnot. And also the mechanism to interact with it. There are two things here, right? It's a state. Where am I and how am I dealing with it? And the code that knows how to work with that device. So we're simply copying it in another place so we can access it. If you want, you can think of it as a link, as a, like a sim link, like a shortcut. So now here is how we implement this command. All right, so we're coming to the point where we can do this. So I'm just going to, to put it here. I'm gonna, it's a PS grep aux. So we'll call it PGA, okay? And let's just get this code in. And then have a look at it and understand because this is exactly what bash does behind scenes well in a more complicated way but this is the spirit of it let me see if i can deal with this includes real quick here Maybe that's all. Let's see a compilation here. All right, Berzend, you're saying something. So with dupe, we just copy the handler wherever it, it, it was left in. Yes, exactly. So both of them take a handler and put it somewhere. Dupe put it, puts it on the next available position in the array, and DAP2 overwrites the position we tell it to overwrite. That's exactly what they do. Nothing more, nothing less. So let's compile this. All right, so we have everything. Let me just uh, indent it a little, like for space and spread it over maybe even put here the command that we need to run here so we're saying ps-ef goes through grab root and then through awk right this is the command that we are running so this is the code so now let's have a look at what it actually does What are we looking at here? We need to run three programs. So that means three execs, and it will also mean three forks because otherwise we lose the current program, right? So three, three forks and three execs, that's a given. And then we need to wire somehow things in between so that whatever this outputs, this one gets. So these are called pipes. And I have two of them, so I will create two pipes. The name is, and we'll have the pipe that goes from PS to grab and the pipe that goes from grab to oc. Okay, and I create them and then I start forking. So, fork exact for PS, right? Fork exact for grab, fork exact for oc. The interesting part is the dup, but I'll get to it. Now I have two pipes, which means I have four ends, and each of these child processes needs to close the ones that it doesn't use. So PS only needs to write to grep. So it, it will keep P2G of one open, close everything else. 
grep needs to read from ps and write to awk so keeps p to g of 0 open and g to a of 1 open closes the rest awk just needs to write from to read from grep so it keeps g to a of 0 open closes the rest and then we call dapt to to do the wiring so what are we saying here <clears throat> in this child process on position 1 which is the standard output put the writing end of this pipe. Now exec will remove the code from this child process and put instead the code of ps, but it will keep the, the open file table. That will not overwrite. That will stay the same. <clears throat> so when ps comes in, Whatever PS writes to the standard output, by the way, PS has no code about pipes in it at all. PS only use, uses printfs, let's say. But whenever it writes to the standard output, it will go in the open file descriptor to position 1. And what will it find there? The handle that writes to the pipe. So practically everything that PS outputs goes to this pipe. Rarish, why are you saying what are you saying? Why does it do the three weights at the end and not after each fork? Uh, well, if I put these weights after each fork, it will be stuck. Um, will it be stuck? Because I would not create the second pro. Well, let's put it like this: if I'm don't, if I'm not creating the second process before this one is finished, and this one writes out a lot of information and ps can write out a lot of information this might fill fill up the pipe but there will be nobody to read from it to clean it up so this will get stuck waiting on a write to a full pipe but if i have a wait here in this place this wouldn't have been would not be created at that point so the whole thing locks up so i want these things to go concurrently and i'm just waiting for them at the end have i answered is it all right if not keep asking please all right so <clears throat> again the child pro process that does ps will have the pipe writing end on the standard output. So whatever this guy writes to the console will go to the pipe. For grep, we, we wire both ends, right? Whenever grep reads from standard input, it will actually read from this pipe in which PS writes. And whenever grep writes to the standard output, it will write to this pipe from which this guy reads. Exactly, William, aka death, is the same trick. But in, so if you if you do a redirection to file instead of uh, instead of having pipes, you just put here a file descriptor. And if you have a simple redirect, then it will be a file open for write only, so the content will be gone. If you have a double, that file would have been opened in append mode, and it will just add to it. OK, uh, water addict, let me just run this so that people see it uh, executing, and then I'll answer your question. So PGA, if I run it, it displays this, which is actually, these are the IDs of the processes of of root this is the windows subsystem linux so there is not a lot of stuff running so you see these are exactly these so the program works and passes things around so water addict is asking how do those programs handle the cases where the pipe doesn't read write as much as it should well <clears throat> this is a very good question actually because what i taught you to do was to send things through pipe with a length prefixed to it right but nobody really forces you to do that as long as you're willing to keep reading from the pipe as much as is there and this is what these programs do 
they read from the pipe as much as is available. And they stop reading when there is no more writer. So then, so for water addict, there is no notion of reading as much as it should. They just read all the way to the end. If, however, you mess up the close statements here, this whole thing locks up because the reading will be stuck waiting for more input, although there is nobody else to provide it. So it's essential to close things right here. Otherwise, it locks up. Okay? Read, in these cases, reads until there are no more writers. There is no other marker for when it should stop. Uh, are we going to get practice programs for this kind of stuff? I'll, I'll provide something, yes. I'll, I'll come up with, with, uh, with uh, problems. My suggestion would be, instead of problems, because you, you have to understand, I'm going to create problems, but you need to understand the concept. So please, before looking for practice problems, solve what's in the lecture. Look at the problem. Look at the solution, put it aside and solve it. This is the first thing. Solve the things that you have a solution for. See if you're able. If not, look again at the solution and so on. All right, do we have other questions for this program? Is it clear how we wire the inputs and outputs to the pipes so the data gets passed? Is it clear how they get stuck if we don't do the proper close? on the pipe end? If not, please ask. It is possible to change input mid-execution, but only in your own code. I cannot really change the output of grep in the middle of its execution from outside. Although, who knows, maybe there are some things that I can hack and get into that, but I'm not aware of an API that does that. It would also be weird when in the middle, just at the point, whatever point of the program execution, from outside you wouldn't really know when you do it. Yes, because what exec LP Actually, the process PS inherits now the handle. So this is for Arish uh, about how what you're asking actually is when is this getting closed, right? When is this getting closed? Well, it's actually simple. Grep, when it finishes up, will close its standard input and standard output. And what will it close when it does? This. And this. So it will close it for you by simply thinking it closes its own standard input and output. Other questions if we if you got All right, then, let's move on to the last piece for today. The last teaching piece, then we'll need to talk about exams and such. The last one is, oh, so there is also this thing uh, nobody asked. How do you reset, how, how do you set back an overwritten handler? So if you do this, how do you get the standard output to be what it was before? Basically, you duplicate the standard output initially, and you save its new position, right? So this will copy the default standard output handler to a new position, and you'll get it here in X. Then you override the standard output with whatever pipe you need. And then when you want to get back, you simply overwrite again the standard output with the copy that you've done before. So that's how you undo it. All right, <clears throat> let's uh, move on to the last part, which is shared memory. Unless there are questions, I'll, I'll, I'll allow a few more 
seconds for questions. All right, so shared memory it is. So this is the last piece that we're doing about uh, processes. Semaphores, indeed. So here is the deal. Besides pipes and FIFOs, there are other mechanisms for talking between processes. And you get them under the generic name of IPC, Interprocess Communication. It's a set of three mechanisms. Uh, one is the semaphore, which provides synchronization between processes. Uh, things like, uh, while I'm doing this, nobody else touches this. Um, then you have message queues, which is a communication mechanism similar, let's say, to email. You send a, me a message to an email box, and then whoever is interested in it reads it. If, you, if you've heard of the notion, you can think of publish, subscribe in a way. And then shared memory. This is the one that we'll be talking about. The others do not, because the API is pretty complex and we don't have time for it. I want to jump to threads. So shared memory, it's an interesting thing. And it's also, if you want, the first step towards understanding threads. Shared memory is literally a region of memory that is somehow mapped into processes and all use the same area. So there will be no more actually sending and receiving. Both processes have the same piece of memory accessible to them, and they just write stuff there and read stuff from there, and that's it. So let's uh, have a little introduction to this. So IPC is uh, you can use IPC to actually communicate between processes that are not related. So IPC will have a way of identifying them, right? Like FIFOs have a path on disk. IPCs are not paths on disks. So they have as identifiers just numbers, which should be unique in the system which makes it possible for you to try to create an IPC with, with a number that already exists, in which case you get an error or maybe you get to use it. So these numbers is, are something that you choose. You can also rely on some specialized functions to give you a number, but basically it's the same thing. You will choose this number and you'll put it in your program. Cleanup, and this is important. And I think when you when you log into the Linux server, you get the warning about this. IPCs are mechanisms that are persistent; they remain in the system. So you may, if you don't clean up, you may reach a limit in maybe number of IPCs or maybe size in memory beyond which the system will refuse to create them, and then maybe the system admin will get mad at you and lock your account. So this is how you clean up IPCs, right? You have a command called IPCS, which will list them. And then you delete them based on that key. So let's see if I've got anything here. Well, I got nothing. There is nothing created, OK? So this is how you clean up. Now, the API of this, and then a little example. So the AP, this is not, by the way, this is not in, in the notes that you have. Uh, I'll publish them today. So the API goes like this. SHM get, which goes from shared memory get, creates a segment of shared memory or gets a handle to an existing one. Once you get the handle, then you need to attach to, to get a pointer if you want to get a pointer to it in your program so that's the so-called attaching then you just use it as any other pointer in your program 
When you're done, you detach the pointer from the shared memory, and then you use SHMCTL to remove it, to remove the segment. That's it. So let's have a look at the program. Now, we've started today with this little program with FIFOs that would get to number. No, 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 wait a second. Not today. Last week, there was this thing read to numbers and then send them to a program, pro to another process, and it will send back its their sum and product and then so on. So, this is what we're going to do today. So, how are we going to use shared memory? Well, you can create it as an array of bytes or you can make use it as a structure. So let's define the structure. A, B, S, P. A, B are the two numbers and then sum and product, right? We declare it. Program A, this is the one that actually creates the shared memory and deletes it. The other one, B, just uses it. So what do we have here? This is going to be the handle to the shared memory. This is a number k that we need to generate some numbers for a and b. And then we declare a pointer to this structure and we call it x. So first thing, let's create the shared memory. SHM get. This is its ID. So this 1, 2, 3, 4, it will be unique on the entire system. M many times students look at this and then on the student server, which you don't access now because we're all at home, but otherwise you would, will simply copy paste this code. And what will happen is they will try to create shared memory with the same ID, which will result in confusion. So my advice is use here maybe your student ID so that you somehow are sure you're not overlapping with anybody else. But on your laptop, it doesn't really matter. As soon as you share though the same thing with others, you have to expect that this may fail because it exists already. So I'm telling it, create the shared memory segments. Well, you don't. Usually, these are not, I'm, I'm answering to author edict. Usually, there are not so many of these. And the ones that are being used have dedicated IDs. So you rely on the fact that you find a number that is free. If not, you'll have to check the value of this and check for the error, because it will give you an error. Well, you can get the list from right here. This is that number. Okay, this is the number that's being used. Nope, that doesn't work, Radish. You cannot read anything from it. You need to first connect to it. So this is how you connect to it or create it. So the way you create it is you say, this is the ID, this is the size that I, that I want, and these are the flags. So I want you to create it with these permissions, okay? If you want to use one that exists already, you just say, I want to use this, and you don't give a size and you don't give any flag, all right? So this might give you an error or something if, if it exists already and you're trying to create it. And after you get an ID, a handle to your shared memory, you simply attach to it. Now, I'm not going to explain these parameters. We don't care for them right now. You simply say, give me a pointer to this shared memory. And you get X. Uh, SHM get is an initialization. Yes, it is either creation or connection to an existing one. Yes, it's an initialization. So SHMAT gives you a pointer to the shared memory. And then you just use it. There is no more communication. You just use it. So the first program just puts a value in A, puts a value in B, checks if the product and the sum is equal, and then it breaks. B calculates the sum and the product, and if they're equal, it breaks. So the beauty with shared memory is that you don't have to send and receive that stuff. You simply use it. You just refer to the content of that shared memory as if it were yours. You don't care. It's actually in a different part of memory, and it's used by others. So when this guy is over, 
detaches the pointer and then deletes the shared memory. When this guy is over, it just detaches. It doesn't delete it because it's this guy's job because he created it. So look at this code a little bit and tell me what do you think it will actually do? <clears throat> will it run as we expect it to run? Or will it do something else? Basically, these two programs do not actually um, give, you know, turns to each other. Exactly. They don't synchronize with each other. So this guy will start up. We'll put two values here. If by chance P and S are initialized with the same value, you know, this is really by chance, it will break and delete the shared memory. By the time this guy comes up, shared memory is not going to be there. So I, I'm, I'm not going to type them. I'm going to copy them from what I've done in the previous class with the Romanian section. Really? And let's have a look. So this is the program that we've been looking at. And let me split Emacs and open here the FIFO so that you see the difference in bidirectional communication. You don't think so? Why? You're right. Darn. No problem. Fixing it. Although I might have messed up the sources there. Oh, well, never mind. I'll fix it because it's really easy. Just do this. This and this, and these two lines will be coming from right here. And that should be it. All right, so let's look at this side by side. So the communication is through FIFO, bidirectional. This guy will be waiting on an empty pipe, FIFO, until this guy writes it here, because that's what read does. It waits on empty. And this guy will wait on empty until this guy writes. Here, nobody waits for anything. This guy writes something there. This guy reads it and uses it. Nobody, There is nothing that checks, well, is it my turn? Is it not my turn? They just go chaotically with no control. 
<clears throat> so this synchronization is required and read and write provide it for us but for shared memory we need to implement it so what we would need here is semaphores but we're not going into them we're gonna learn about them with threads so for now i'm just leaving this as it is for threads though they will work just like this threads have access to the whole process memory threads are inside the process so all the global variables and all the heap is accessible to threads just like shared memory so threads communicate among them just like this just write stuff into memory <coughs> and um, then you need to synchronize them and then you'll have mutexes and semaphores and whatnot now i have a question here about using signals you could now let me put it like this you could try to synchronize this by adding another field in the structure something like whose turn it is and then keep checking it so you can come up with homemade solutions for synchronization but there are very subtle issues and they will work apparently fine until they break and you, it's hard to make them work right so my suggestion is use the dedicated mechanisms for this like semaphores mutexes and so on with signals i don't know how you would use it here the signal interrupts the program so what would you do until the signal comes i'm not sure how you would see this happening so for now i'm just le leaving it like this if you run these things they will just do nothing uh, let's see right what what okay it's not used i'll ignore that for now so i start away this guy just does nothing ob dies because it tries to connect to the shared memory and it's not there anymore because this guy deleted it so we need synchronization all right so you you want to rely on a variable to tell you whose turn it is, right? Okay. Please read about volatile and how that differs in implementation on different systems and how that doesn't really do what you expect all the time. So it's it's more like a trap. Using a variable like this, it's like a time bomb. It will look fine, work fine most of the time, and then get you in trouble when you least expect it. So I will keep insisting, no homemade solutions here. Use, <laughs> well, no, I don't agree with Radish. A fork bomb is something that you see right away. A time bomb is really bad because you don't know when it's going to go off and you won't know how to prevent it and how to stop it. So fork bomb, it's actually easy. You just unplug it if worse comes to worse so um all right this is it about processes if you guys have more questions oh i took greater as in uh worse yep i agree then with you all right i have a problem from headshot spy in the example with the song all right this is the example with the song how do we make sure the fifo is empty there is no fifo here this is going to be a pipe behind scenes p open uses fork exec, dup2, and pipes. There is no FIFO. In the previous example, 
I guess you're asking what if what if the FIFO is not empty? Uh, we don't ensure that in any way, but we we could maybe delete and and recreate it. Okay, so should there be other questions? Just uh, write them i'll answer for now i just want to switch to talking about tests and consulting hours and so on so uh, apparently we should be back at school or at least this uh, emergency state should be lifted sometimes in middle of may which means we might be at school the last three weeks but I kind of doubt it. Even if they lift it, I don't think we'll want a crowd in in rooms with exams. I, I'm not quite sure of that. So we'll see. So I'm getting ready to start online tests and exams. So the way this will work, for those of you who've taken a test at least, you'll connect to a server, you'll get an account, you'll get in, solve the problem, and so on. Uh, there will be some changes so that you can connect from home. Uh, since these are going to be done from home, obviously, uh, people will use, uh, <clears throat> let's say, unauthorized uh, sources of inspiration. So we'll try to prevent that so that we keep things fair. So people who work to get a grade that reflects their work and people who didn't will get a grade that reflects that. Uh, so your sessions will be uh, recorded and you'll also share your screen with us so that we can watch what's happening there. We'll do our best to keep things as fair as possible. Um, we have five tests and two partial exams, right? These are seven things. Now, some of you have taken this one some of you haven't. So Teamworks makes dream work. Yeah, we'll see. Well, th this is what I'm afraid of, because those grades will not mean anything. And uh, I would like them to mean something and reward people who actually put the work in. So I'm going to combine this and this. For those of you who took this, you're not going to get it again. But those who didn't will take this in one shot. This too also will go in one shot. Maybe even this goes together with this and this, but I don't know for sure. And then this will be done separately. And it will all happen after the break. And after the break, we have six weeks and four or five exams. So this will be a weekly thing. It will be really intense. I'll try to, to I don't know how to make it easier on you. And I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be the only one who does this. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, but I would like you to be well prepared for this. I You, you have the lectures online i download whatever is not available on twitch i'll post it on youtube and i will have consulting hours to answer your questions so with the romanian section i schedule something tomorrow at nine and if you need to be there be there but i'll have to speak in romanian because otherwise it's not going to work if you have question in english just go ahead and i'll try to answer as well it will probably happen on discord and also on Tuesday at 9, I will also do consulting hours. So prepare with questions. Consulting hours does not mean I will teach. It means I will answer questions. So any questions about the material, but I would like them to be specific, very narrow questions. I can do something like, you know, represent, reteach a larger section. But not a lot. I would want specific questions. Why is this like this? Why is this like that? Because without that, I will just deliver 
the same thing again and you'll still not get anything so i need you to tell me where you're not getting things so that's about it uh, if your network connection is bad uh, we'll have a way of doing that with you well i don't know how we're gonna fix that but i would like to 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 have people start getting grades and uh, find a way to 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 do this even if some of you are stuck somewhere with really bad uh, network how exactly are you going to take the test you're gonna ssh into a server and uh, probably on amazon and you're gonna have your problem to solve there in the command line now you'll have to putty into my server you will putty into my server you're not gonna do it on your local servers and that's where you're gonna put the solution and we're gonna grade it and we're gonna let you know how you've done all right <clears throat> Of course you can. Yeah, it's SSH. You can connect from Windows with Putty or from Linux and Mac OS with the SSH command on the command line. Yeah, you can use a VM, but we will ask you to share the screen from your host operating system. So we'll see how that works. Anyway, we'll, we'll announce the terms because, you know, cheating is really easy. So we're going to watch your session. Anything that you type in there will be recorded. If we just see a whole program being pasted, that's something that's not all right. So we're going to look into it and expect to be asked questions of your, about your session. If you don't know what's there again, there will be trouble. We'll, we'll find ways of making this, uh, you know, as serious as possible. Yes, the same this well is not going to be two hours for one problem was it two hours for you it's not going to be two hours it's it's much less 20 or 30 minutes okay good prayers i'm going to tell you good prayers uh, are the ones with action so just start exercising and ask for advice if you don't know how to do it Uh, online documentation, I will let you know what you can and cannot use. It will be very clear. We are still working on how to do this. Yes, no, the regular test rules is that you can use everything that's in that command line on the exam server. So that stays the same. Do, will we allow other uh, references? I don't think so, but we'll, we're, we're thinking about it because it it really is also a matter of what we can enforce or not. Uh, I believe shell. So grab said awk and shell will be the first thing normally. Then C processes and possibly threads. And I think the exams afterwards will we'll move. The, we used to take the shell exam earlier on so that you're not too crowded towards the end but it may be better if we push the exams to the end we'll, we'll see the, the point is to you for you to have enough uh, time to to study next week i would like to have a rehearsal so that we are sure uh, this, the system works and can hold as many connections as so probably next week in the lecture i'll ask everybody to connect to the server or something to see how it responds to the load can anybody tell me how many people are watching this right now just as a curiosity somehow i can't see it on twitch so we'll see how how this uh, 60 something all right so so this uh This will see we'll see seventy connections at at a time. It should it should be easily easily handled.
and then the tests will start after the break. So you'll still have you still have two weeks from now. I'm a good teacher. You mean kind? <laughs> I don't know. Let's wait till the end of the semester when you get your grade. That's that's when we'll know if if I'm kind or not. For now, I just want you to learn to be good at this. The grade is just a number. If you know what you're doing, the grade doesn't really matter much. You're not even in my class. Well, who the heck are you? <laughs> the truth is, this is this is public, so I can get anybody here. The 69 people here are most likely not my students. So where the heck are my students? Free knowledge. Yeah, right. You see what the virus does to you? Uh, all right. William, aka Death. I don't know about the written exams. I'm expecting even those to be, to be done remotely. If possible, yeah, we'll do them at school. But you know, crowding uh, 90 people in a room with one seat free between them and one behind the other, that's, I, I feel that's too, too close to, to feel safe. So probably online. <sighs> All right, guys, any other questions? Because we're moving the conversation to something else, apparently, with all the free knowledge stuff. All right, then. Uh, I'm done. You have a good day. Stay safe inside, bored but healthy, because hospitals suck. And we'll hear, just watch Piazza, watch the class webpage. I'll, I'll let you know the rules for examinations. All right, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right.